everyone, this is Matt Matthew's show uh, with Intro Stats and today we're looking at uh, introducing the Categorical Association Hypothesis Test. So the Categorical Association Test, another one of those famous relationship tests, this is the classic Categorical Relationship Test. So if you're trying to see if two categorical data sets indicate a relationship between the variables, uh, this is the test. So we've been talking about how through all these relationship tests we want to kind of know the null and alternative hypothesis, what type of data do we need for this test, what are the assumptions for this test, and what test statistic are we going to be using. So um, let's talk a little bit about the null and alternative hypothesis for the categorical association test. All right, so the null hypothesis would be that categorical variables are not related. And the alternative would be that the category variables are related. Sometimes you'll see this as not associated or associated for the alternative. Or you might see it as independent for the null hypothesis uh, versus dependent for the alternative hypothesis. So there are different ways you'll see this written in different stat books. Um, but the idea is very important. Like, how are we going to show that? How are we going to show that the categorical variables are not related versus related. Well, again, it goes back kind of like what we were doing with goodness of fit. If you remember in the goodness of fit, we were trying to show that if the percentages were equal, then it kind of would not matter what group I'm in, and that would indicate the grouping is not really related to the percentage we're dealing with. But now, with the categorical association test, we're dealing with multiple percentages in multiple groups. But the idea is still the same. So what we usually say, think of it this way, if there, if the, if, again, ask yourself the question, does it matter what group I'm in, right? Does it matter what group you're in? So um, the categorical variables are not related, would indicate that it, all the groups have about the same percentage for that variable. So sometimes you'll see here, here stat books say the distribution of conditional percentages are the same or equal. And uh, if the data, if the quantitative uh, categorical variables are related, we expect that the distribution of conditional percentages would be different. So we'll kind of flush that out a little bit about what we mean by that. But again, it goes back to the more equal to, the more closely the percentages align. Um, in the various groups, that's going to tell me the grouping doesn't matter. But if the, if the percentages are very different, then maybe it does matter what group you're in. All right, so what kind of data do we need? Well, we really need two categorical data sets uh, collected from uh, either, you can collect them in two ways, um, but basically you're going to get two sort of bits of categorical information from people. So, um, like, we might be asking them, do you have a tattoo, yes or no, and what, social, what type of social media do you prefer? Twitter, Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram? Um, so if we were asking the same one, one random sample of people, that the, those, both of those questions, two questions, that's a possibility. We could get that data that way. Another way might be to... Uh, collect the data from multiple random samples. So I might collect, just ask them one categorical question. So I might um, go to uh, a random sample of people with tattoos and I might ask them what's your favorite social media? And I know all these people have tattoos. Uh, or I might, and then I might go to another random sample of people that do not have tattoos and I know these people don't have tattoos and I would ask them what's their favorite social media. At the end of the day, I'm still going to get the same data. I'm going to get a, a, a categorical data set asking about tattoos and a social media. So the question is, if, the, if, the, if it came from one random sample or it came from multiple random samples, you can kind of get the same test. Uh, I kind of refer to both of these as just a categorical association test. The data is going to look a lot alike. Now, there are slight differences. You'll, in fact, if you have one random sample, if I just ask two categorical questions from one random sample of people, people in the stat world sometimes refer to that as an independence test. Um, and then 
just a name. Like I say, I, I kind of call these things all categorical association tests, but a lot of people like to make distinctions. If you have multiple random samples, so in other words, I, 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 I got different random samples for my groups, and then I just ask them one categorical question in each of my groups. Um, sometimes they refer to that in stat books as a homogeneity test. Again, just names that you like, might hear in stat books. Um, they'll say something about independence homogeneity. Like I say, it's really the same idea. It's just a matter of semantics of how the data was collected. There's also slight differences in the way we would check our assumptions, depending on if we collected the data from one random sample or multiple random samples. Now, the one of the big keys was that you can summarize your data, your counts, in a contingency table, or a two-way table, as some people refer to it. A contingency table is a way of sort of summarizing your counts. So it kind of looks like this. This is a contingency table right here. This one has to do with music and trying to memorize information. So that's, uh, but this is what a, a table looks like. If your data looks like this, you know you're doing the categorical association test. A lot of people ask me, well, how do I know if it's going to be a goodness of fit test or a categorical association test? Well, if your data looks like that, if it's a, it's a contingency, contingency table, you know you're doing the categorical association test. If I was only looking at maybe just a, a few observed counts from one particular variable, then that's going to be the goodness of fit. Like if I just looked at high retention, just this, these three numbers, 10, 11, and 18, then that would be a goodness of fit. But if I have more data uh, dealing with different retention levels, then that's going to now be, have to go uh, graduate to the categorical association test. Okay, um, so how are we going to do this? Well, a couple things. Um, our assumptions and our test statistic is actually going to be the same as what we looked at in the goodness of fit test. So we got, uh, we're going to be using the chi-square test statistic again, same as the goodness of fit, uh, the sum of the observed counts minus the expected counts, squared divided by the expected counts. Um, the degrees of freedom formula will be a little bit different. In uh, goodness of fit, we were doing uh, k minus 1, where k was the number of groups. But now you have rows and columns, because you have a table. So we use the formula rows minus 1 times the number of columns minus 1. That's the formula for degrees of freedom for a categorical association test. Again, a lot of the stuff we're talking about today can all be calculated very quickly with a computer. This is more about understanding the ideas of what the computer is doing so we can kind of explain it to people and sort of have a better understanding of it. Um, just like we did with goodness of fit, we have the assumptions, right? We, we said uh, we wanted random sample or samples, depending on if you have one random sample or multiple random samples. So it could just be one random sample that you ask two categorical questions from, or it might be multiple random samples that you're asking one categorical question from different groups. Um, and that's where the, the assumptions can sort of change. If you ask the data from one random sample, then really you just need the individuals in that one random sample to be independent of each other. So usually it would just say individuals within the sample are uh, independent. Or we want the individuals within the sample to be independent. Now, if I collected the data from multiple random samples, right, multiple random samples, again sometimes referred to as a homogeneity test, then I would want the individuals within the samples and between the samples to be independent. Right? So the, there's a slight variation in terms of the, of the assumptions. We're still looking for everybody in the data to basically be independent of each other and not have people that are related in some way. Again, uh, to get the um, data set to be big enough, we actually check that the expected counts should be at least five. Right? That's the same as actually the goodness of fit. Uh, we need all the expected counts to be at least five, five or greater. So when you get a printout from the computer program, make sure you look for the expected counts. The computer will calculate the expected counts for you, and you want to make sure you check that they're all bigger than five. If any of your expected counts actually drop below five, a lot of times the computer program will give you an error message. It will say, hey, your data set's not big enough to handle this test. Some of your expected counts are too low. 
Um, just remember that the idea of the chi-square is observed versus expected. We kind of talked about this with the uh, goodness of fit test, the observed sample count. So the observed counts are what happened, what really happened in the sample data. So these numbers right here in the table, right here, not the totals, but the, just the numbers in the table, those are what we call the observed counts. But then we need to sort of calculate verse, uh, and compare the observed counts to what we expect to happen if the null hypothesis was true. And that's where this gets really tricky. How do I figure out what I expect to happen if the categorical variables are not related? Okay, that's where, that's where we're going to dig into this example and see if we can understand that a little bit. How do we get the expected counts? Okay? So if, when you hear the word observe, think sample data, expected counts, think null hypothesis, right? Theoretical counts based on the null hypothesis. All right, so let's take a look at an example here. We got, some, got an example here. Uh, this is actually one of the examples I, I pulled from my book. Um, and uh, we are basically looking at um, a, an experiment that was done uh, compared to try to show that um, listening to music um, is, is or is not related to um, memorizing information. A lot of college students think that if they listen to music, they may be better at uh, memorizing information. And so basically they did a little experiment on this. This is actually an experiment that's been done quite a few times. The interesting part of this experiment was that they allowed the student to listen to their favorite music so, so one, one, one sample of, of students got to listen to their favorite music while they tried to memorize information. The other had to listen to a music that they hated. Now, they all had to listen to the same hated music. So whatever that hated music was, they all had to listen to hate, the music they absolutely hated. And then uh, one sample of people uh, got to listen to um, uh, no music. No music. So this was three different samples and that had to actually memorize uh, information and see how they did to memorize information. Again, this, if you're kind of talking about whether it was independence or homogeneity, um, this would be uh, the homogeneity variety because we had multiple random samples and we, so we had three different random samples of people. Um, okay, so let's.